Good evening. Oh, there we go. Thank you all for staying for uh, our post uh, filming discussion. Um, for those of you who don't recognize him, and I can't imagine there's anyone in this room that doesn't, this is Dion Diamond. My name is Linda Adams, and I've been asked to uh, moderate this panel. We have Alana Trackman, our filmmaker. And Devin Mancart, who is an educator, curriculum developer. He's going to talk to us a little bit about where do we go from here. Um, I've had a number of, an opportunity to have a number of discussions with Alana about not wanting this film to be a nostalgia piece. Um, it's obviously a feel-good piece of work, but we need to think about um, what we are going to do going forward and how we can each as individuals and as members of our congregations and churches um, and people of conscience um, continue this work, these collaborations and these relationships. So I think I'd like to start with Alana to talk a little bit about um, what you see as the future for this film. I thank you so much for coming and I want to thank the JCC for hosting the film and just I'm so honored by having these incredible panelists and Linda moderating. Um, and I just want to add to um, Deborah's biography is that she actually runs Teaching for Change, which is a curriculum um, develop, developing uh, organization that provides like, incredibly high quality curriculum about how to teach the civil rights movement. Um, so, tell me the question again. <laughs> where do you see your film? Oh, where do I see? Thank you. Where would I like to see the film be used? So, first and foremost, um, the film, uh, to me, is, uh, I want it to be used as a supplement to how we teach the civil rights movement. I think, you know, I, I haven't been in fifth or eighth grade in a long time, but I have children who have, and what they're taught is, is fairly um, superficial. You know, they learn about uh, Martin Luther King and John Lewis, and you know, at Hebrew school, they learn about Abraham Joshua Heschel, and they have a sense of this handful of people who participated, and while that's incredibly important, and I'm glad they know about the giants, I wish they knew, well, they, my children do, obviously, <laughs> but um, I wish that all children learned about the, the vast majority of people who battled in the civil rights movement. I mean, the, it, the, not everybody went to Selma. I mean, the vast majority of civil rights protests, there are hundreds of them all across the country, and people acted locally. People stood up in their own, um, in their own towns, at their own swimming pools, um, at their own amusement parks, at their own lunch counters. And I think it's really important that we learn that it's people like our grandmother or like our seventh grade science teacher, and therefore it's people like us and that everybody has the capacity to be an actor on history stage. Everybody has agency to work for social justice. And you know, if we only teach about the lions, then we deny everybody you know, the opportunity to think of themselves as somebody who has capacity. Um, so I, first and foremost, I would like the film to be used in schools. Uh, I also would like the film to be used as a flint to start or restart or continue conversations in between synagogues and black churches. Um, I was talking to somebody about the film recently and you know, point, they pointed out that in 1960, 
African American children and white children could not legally swim in the swimming pool together. But the people on the picket line could have long, daily conversations that took place for hours. And so, you know, when Dion sings, it was about getting to know you, getting to know all about you, which is something I particularly adore. Um, that, that kind of opportunity to know each other, but more than opportunity, willingness to get to know each other um, was present in a way that I think today, while we legally can all swim in the same swimming pool, we don't necessarily feel like we can have those kinds of conversations. And um, I hope that the film is just a starting place for like-minded communities, specifically black churches and synagogues as a way to start, um, can, see the, can see the film, can talk about response to the film, and then can think about what they can do together in terms of uh, pursuing local social justice causes. Thank you. Deborah, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit to tell us about what you see in terms of your curriculum development and how you address some of the issues um, how you use the film in some of your issues. Sure, I'd be happy, happy to. Um, first, I just wanted to ask a question, if that's okay. How many people here, if anyone had family or would, grew up in Bannockburn? Glen Echo. In Glen, or near Glen Echo. Anybody involved in the Glen Echo protests besides, of course, Dion down here? And anybody who knew this history before learning about this film? How many people knew the history before? That's great. And that's probably unusual. <laughs> um, and the reason I'm saying that is that what we've seen in our work, so with Teaching for Change, which is both active in the DC area and also nationally um, around, and we collaborate with Rethinking Schools on a project called the Zinn Education Project, named for Howard Zinn, that over the last 10 years, there's been a lot more teaching about people's history and an understanding of people's history more broadly and the civil rights movement in particular, in part because teachers have been learning this when they go to college and said, you know, why didn't I learn this in school? And then committing to do the same, to turn that around themselves. Um, I think the visibility of the SNCC veterans, uh, there's a, if you haven't visited the SNCC Legacy Project website, I recommend doing that. Um, and then, so people are more aware of the history, but then of course we've seen, the, um, starting really in the spring of 2021, the, uh, the right wing recognizing the power of young people learning that history for the very reason Alana said, that once young people realize they don't have to wait for a hero on a pedestal, and that actually the heroes on the pedestals were much more complicated than what, even if young people actually learned the true story of Dr. King would be all in better shape. Um, but that the right wing has launched a really vicious attack, which I think we all hear about the book bans, we hear about the, um, the laws against teaching history honestly, but it's really what's spread more pervasively is a McCarthy era like chilling effect. So that even teachers in school districts where there are no laws are cutting back on what they're teaching. So the advances we've made in the last few years are, are cut way back and so we continue to advocate for teachers to be able to use films like the one you just saw, which is so powerful for young people, not only seeing the role they can play, but being able to predict the obstacles, the challenges, realizing sometimes it's just a small group, you know, so uh, challenging all the myths they learn in the textbooks. And so when you're asking you know, what, what do we hope people can do, a lot of it is to, to speak up at school board meetings, to advocate for the right for young people to learn this history, and to pay attention not just to the laws, but also the high stakes testing, which can be as um, destructive as the, as the laws that really um, means that teachers just don't have the time to show a film and discuss a film like this, because what's gonna be on the test are the, the, the names that you, that you mentioned. So I think around our work is both developing curriculum and then also advocating for the right to, for teachers to teach and for students to learn. Um, and in large part because the crises we face today 
we need young people to think critically, to take action, just like we saw the young people in the film doing, and that in order to do that, they need to learn from history about how to take on the crisis today. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. So this brings me to you, Mr. Dion. Ouch. <laughs> I've seen this film a number of times, and each time I see it and I watch you, I say to myself, what was he thinking? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Obviously, I'm still into it. I don't even know how to use it. <laughs> At any rate, um, I'll start the response with saying, for me, it was something I categorized as youthful exuberance. People still ask me today, would I still do the same things that I did back then? Of course, if I were still younger, <laughs> I would. But nevertheless, um, you know, I, I've seen this movie before, and I'm sorry I came in late because I thought I'd seen it. But seeing it again makes me re recall a whole bunch of stuff that I did that I think was no more than youthful exuberance. Today, um, I still have a mortgage that I'm paying for. Today, I um, have responsibilities that I didn't have back then. And I'm not certain how my life would have changed had I not done the stuff that I did back then. Um, I'm not certain if I'm answering the question, but I think I think a part of this um, is I now have a great grandchild. I now have grandchildren, and they have no appreciation whatsoever for the stuff that I experienced. And that saddens me. Um, I don't know if a part of this was um, re related to the African American Museum. I tried to take them there, and I tried to take them to Glen Echo. Um, they had no what, appreciation for seeing my face and my involvement in anything. And that hurts. Now, to the issue at hand, if you don't know your history, you don't know what's going to come back and bite you in the butt. I try to tell everyone that will listen, learn your history. Because that's the only way you're going to profit in the future. I'm not certain if that responds to. Anyway, um, look, I'd like to thank you for, Atlanta, for indeed um, putting this together. There are a whole bunch of documentaries there. Um, by the way, when I see uh, my face up on the screen, <laughs> It's not the same face that you <laughs> um, But nevertheless, I, I thank you for your production. No, we thank you for your work. <laughs> I think we're probably ready to take some questions from our audience members. Um, thank you so very much, everyone, and thank you, um, Linda, for uh, inviting me. I have a comment, if that's okay. I apologize for the people who were around me, but when that jingle came on, I was saying, let go of music, oh, I broke out in tears. And I broke out in tears because I remember that big jingle. I'm a little older than I look, y'all. 
And I, I don't think so. Asking my mother if I could go to, we could go to Glen Echo, and she always said no, but never told me why. I never knew why, as a little child, I could not go to Glen Echo until much, much later. So, my brother Dion, thank you so very much, because the person, and I understand there was controversy around that, but who helped to lead that movement, Lawrence Henry, was part of the great Henry family, and I learned, I mentored at the feet of his younger brothers, Richard Henry and Milton Henry, also known as Del Fidelli brothers. Lester Henry became the chief endocrinologist at Howard University Medical School. So all of that family, uh, my dear Ilana, that's a, a film to be looked at. So I just want to say thank you for bringing this. I'd love for there to be some type of partnership with Howard University um, to bring that um, there. I used to teach there and would love that to happen. So I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And the last thing I just want to say is that trauma continues. Because I didn't realize I was holding on to that trauma from a, being a little girl uh, back then in the, in the late 50s. I didn't know that I was holding on to that trauma until just now. Seeing this on the big screen and bursting out in tears, something I've never, ever done. So again, thank you for helping me to heal. count. <laughs> you have to understand that, especially the lady who just spoke regarding Lawrence Henry, he was a senior. Um, I didn't get he, he was a grad student when I was an undergrad student at what is now Drew Hall, used to be called um, New Men's Dorm. But Howard University has a reputation for being the zenith in black education, at least at the time it had the um, moniker. And when the sit-in started, we wanted to find out what is it that all of the South, the predominantly black um, institutions, are having sit-ins, and yet we in Washington, D.C., supposedly, the capstone of black and, um, education, are doing nothing. You know, DC was not legally a segregated town. So there was no place that we could attack. But we knew if we went over to, on the other side of the river, into Virginia, hey, we can attack. And that's how we started. But the answer to your question is, it was only a handful of people that went over into Virginia. And I don't know, quite frankly, to this day, how we got more people, especially whites, um, to join us. Um, I think literally there were only about 10 to 15 people from Howard who started this stuff because the white folks didn't, the white folks, notice how I put that. Um, I, I, I don't know what gravitated them to join us. Um, and I, but I will say this, we were over in Virginia and we, within, within a very short period of time, totally desegregated public accommodations in Northern Virginia. But once we got that done so quickly with overcoming the American Nazi Party and, and all the rest of the stuff that you guys now are familiar with, we said, what else can we do? Well, you know, the Potomac River <laughs> separates 
Virginia and Maryland. And we said, let's go on the other side of the river, i.e. Glen Echo. Now, kids were bust to, I'm sorry, trolley, trolley, trolley card um, from the district at District P, okay? Fresh with our winnings, if you will, um, in Virginia, we just decided to take on Green Echo. And I must admit, we never thought that we would get what the, what's the word I'm looking for? We never thought we would get the people who joined us at Green Echo. Um, Bannockburn is a community that surrounds Glen Echo Amusement Park. Um, we didn't know about we didn't know about the labor union organization that came into play um, at Ben Echo, and I'm saying Ben Echo. <laughs> You get my drift. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. We forged some lifetime relationships with the people there. And I must admit, um, for many of us, that was my, at least I'll speak for myself. It was the first time that I had interaction with white folks. Um, I'm from Petersburg, Virginia, an all black. Um, neighborhood in Petersburg. And I never had that exposure. But nevertheless, as a result of the civil rights activity, I got exposed to folks who took me um, as a person and not based on my color. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but. Making, making all the sense in the world. Deborah, you wanted to tell us a little bit about Howard. Well, I, I just wanted to add, let's see, can you hear me? Yeah. Let's see if I'm on again. Testing, testing. Okay. Testing, yeah. Just a quick note to add that part of the reason that there weren't challenges in DC at the time was because of the work of Pauli Murray and others at Howard a decade before and that whole desegregation fight. So I think Howard really has a powerful legacy for, for people to study. And so many stories like that, which I think you can imagine what we keep finding is that young people say that they hate history until they get to learn this kind of history. And then they go, oh my gosh, it's so important, it's so meaningful, it's so interesting. And so young people really have the right and the need to, to learn this history in K through 12 and are perfectly capable of it. I think the right wing understands that, which is why they're trying to suppress it. But I think we need to defend the right for young people, literally K through 12, um, to engage in, in learning this history. Wanted to say something? Yeah, I just want to add on to that. So um, in researching the film, I spoke to, I believe, every single Howard student who is still alive who was on the picket line. And I, I think at the height, there were 14 of them. Um, and I think it's important that we don't underestimate how brave what Dion and the other students from Howard did was, because part of the reason that there weren't more people from Howard is because Howard University did not condone it. Howard University did not let NAG be an official student group on campus. They actually had to meet off campus because Howard was receiving federal government subsidies and were right after McCarthy. And so um, Howard was not interested in, in promoting this as a, as a reasonable activity. And, and especially for the women, um, Cortland Cox, who's, who's in the film, told me that you know, women would graduate from, from Howard and their mothers would cry and say, you know, I sent you to Howard to to get a husband, not to get a degree. Um, and so, you know, there was, there was certainly a great fear uh, among, among the black middle class of getting arrested for good reason. 
So, I mean, it, it was a really sparse group, and that group was absolutely acting against the status quo. And the same is true of, of the white people. I mean, the reason that the editorials are in the film and they're so vile is because that was public sentiment. That was published. That was in the Washington Post. You could say that, and they would publish it. And so to, to stand up and to be at Glen Echo every day for 10 weeks all summer long um, was, was a subversive act, even though there was plenty of other reasons that people did it. And I hope you've got a sense of some of them. But, um, but it was extremely unusual. And this is 1960, it's really early. Hello, how you doing? My name is Andre Soares. Nice to meet everybody. I attend Howard University currently. I'm a senior there. My question is to you, Mr. Diamond. I wanted to ask you if you believe that Howard students currently and any college students in general are still exuding that youthful exuberance you mentioned. And a second part to that question is how do you, what do you think the biggest challenge that as college students we face on campus or off? that we can, you know, tackle by doing little things every day. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> um, number one, I, I, I think you have to truly appreciate the environment that you live in. If you, this is not gonna sound right, It's going to be political. Um, you have an election that's coming up. We have an election that's coming up. Um, I was too young to vote at the time that I got involved. That's not the same that you can say. Um, I think you ought to be more cognizant, more aware of what is going on politically and how it influences how you live on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I, I admonish you to take unto yourself what the future for you will be by looking at not individuals, but look at the policies that they suggest that they want to imbue into you. Um, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Um, Howard University is not alone any longer in terms of a merely a racial institution. Your vice president and your vice president and your presidential nominee is a graduate of Howard. Never in my life did I think that might come about. Let me digress for a moment. After Glen Echo and the Freedom Ride, I became involved in voter registration in, throughout the South. One of the locations that I worked in was Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Southern University. Um, we never thought that we could, at most, get someone elected locally. We had a, re a reenactment. We had a reunion um, of people who were involved in Oprah Winfrey did this. We had a reunion. And believe it or not, we, we had We had what we thought 
maybe one day in life, one day in life, you have to understand something. I am now 83 years of age. We never thought back then that we would get a person elected at the local level. We never thought that we would get a person elected at the county level. We never thought that we would get someone elected at the state level. Since then, we most certainly didn't think of having persons elected to, to the US Congress. Uh, we have now gotten to the point of a president of the United States. So you, you see, you can make a difference. Uh, you are a senior. I don't know what you plan to do with the balance of your life. But believe me, get involved more so than you are now, more so than any of you can think in terms of the impact that you can make on your future and this country. I'm not certain if that's And by the way, um, I don't know what part of the movie that uh, you might have seen. I've been arrested so many freaking times. <laughs> but the one that I really like most is the charge from Southern University of my being criminal anarchy. They said I was trying to overthrow the government of the state of Louisiana. And guess what? They were right. <laughs> We'll, we'll take one more question. We'll take two more questions. <laughs> oh, it's an, an incredibly beautiful and moving film. Uh, Lonnie, thank you so, so much. You, so you, you opened the, the evening saying you, you hope it will um, serve as a flint to deepen relations between uh, communities. I, I have a hypothesis for one element of what I think is, is necessary for those sparks to expand. And I'm wondering what you and any of your co-panelists um, might think of it. And, and um, the hypothesis is that th this story, the story of the black and Jewish communities with arms locked, is, is told eight days a week in, in the Jewish community. Like I went to Hebrew school, I grew up in Jewish institutions. If I've seen the picture of Rabbi Heschel and Dr. King once, I've seen it a thousand times. If I've heard of Goodman, Cheney and Schwerner, et cetera. And that is absolutely to be celebrated. And among the white community, um, Jews were disproportionately supportive and engaged with, I refer, refer of course only to the Ashkenazi Jewish community, but there's a whole other story. And Dr. Heschel was basically hounded off the faculty of the Jewish Theological Seminary, the most prestigious institution of Jewish higher education at the time, for his involvement. And the overwhelming majority of the American Jewish community, including the rabbinate, was opposed. And when Dr. King wrote, um, you know, why we can't wait to northern clergy, the rabbinate was part of that. And the intellectual foundation against affirmative action was arguably laid in the pages of Commentary Magazine, edited by Norman Podoritz, funded by the American Jewish Committee, etc. There's a lot more to be said in both columns. My point is the American Jewish community revels in column A and buries column B. And until we look at column B, we, the American Jewish community, that flint is not gonna work, is my hypothesis. And I wonder what you think. Thank you, thank you for that, Craig. Um, I agree with you 100%. And I don't know if I would have pursued making this film, this is a weird thing to say, but if I didn't find out that the owners were Jewish. And um, I think that is such an important point. Not because, you know, not because I, I want to, you know, drown their name out, but because, you know, this this is not a movie that's about the civil rights movement writ large. It's not about black Jewish relationship in the civil rights movement writ large, and I would hate for it to be taken that way. It's really a movie about one moment in time, one group of people, one location, 
the fact that it was outside of Washington, D.C. No, 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 no. It's a beautiful piece of art. Oh, thank you, but, but what, but it is, like, it is in some ways, you know, represents lots of other people and lots of other protests. And those Jewish owners represent a big portion of the Jewish community that was not just indifferent and not just anti other people, you know, acting on their behalf, but was actually, you know, continuing to enforce segregation. So, um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. So somebody said you had a question. Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my husband. <laughs> a little bit on the theme there, but uh, one of the, at least the protesters in the movie focus numerous times on the commonality of interests amongst Jews and blacks, and how the Holocaust influenced their need to get involved, and the same threats that they saw, and you, it didn't take much to realize that the American Nazi Party saw everyone in the as, as the enemy. Um, so while I recognize the column B for sure, and think I agree with what Craig said that you have to, we have to look at that and examine it. Um, how do we build and remind ourselves of that commonality? Because at least I fundamentally believe in it, and uh, and fear that we've lost track of that. I agree with you. We have lost track. And I think, wow, I don't know who I'm going to alienate with this. <laughs> Several years ago, after my involvement in the civil rights movement, um, and I said after my involvement, I still like to think that I'm still involved. But, but I went to a a jewelry store. Well, it's coming back. <laughs> um, in my youth, I used to work in what we call the Jewish Alps, um, the Catskills. <laughs> right. Um, and I, you can't work up there without picking up some Yiddish. <laughs> I went um, to a, a jewelry store on Lower Connecticut Avenue at the time, and I was about to buy a very expensive piece of jewelry for my wife. And I walked in the door, and there was a salesman and a salesperson, I don't know if I'm making, there was a salesperson who was stuck trying to sell jewelry to the retailer. Are you following me? Yeah. Okay. And when I walked through the door, the guy says, ah, oh, here's this Fatsa. Mm -hmm. Now, I wasn't supposed to know or hear what he was saying. There were some other words, disparaging. Um, and then the guy with a big smile on his face said to me, oh, may I help you, sir? I said, it's Kish Ryan took us. I think with that, um, I have never seen a person blush so much. At any rate. Um, let me tell you, uh, there are persons who are of the Jewish faith who are just members of the Nazi party also. So we, we should not think that just because of a person of, of a religious orientation is being forever loyal to a relationship. Forget it. The point is, what can you as an individual do to combat situations like I've just described? I don't know if I make any sense, but um, yeah. Everybody's not your best friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Okay. 
And I would just like to, to add to what you said, and, and first also by saying that the useful exuberance is clearly here, because you're here this evening on top of, I'm sure, a lot of studies and other work you're doing for schools, so hats off to you. Um, just to, to add that I think what Craig said is, is it Craig, right? Is, is right about the complexity, because if young people are very, young people are sharp, they have questions, they want to know, and the first thing we can do in school is to, uh, to sort of silence that or discourage that when we when we oversimplify things. And for example, the some of the civil rights veterans that have their stories of the SNCC Legacy Project, some of the Jewish ones talk about not being allowed to go to synagogues when they were because they were fighting for equality, because they were fighting for Jewish values, they were not allowed to go to synagogues. Young people need to know that. They also need to know that black activists at HBCUs were, were kicked out, that professors were kicked out. Um, they need to know the complexity of white folks, that you know, John Brown was not crazy, he's someone to be admired, um, but then also that white supremacy, you know, that the Democratic Party in the South was, uh, you know, yep. literally had white supremacy in the name. That wasn't, that's not a new thing we've invented. Um, so I think that, and that complexity, is, because otherwise what we're seeing today is an oversimplification that the media can get it away with. And they can say that, you know, someone who is uh, speaking, you know, just to say it, speaking about Palestine has to be anti-Semitic. And that, you know, speaking about any issue gets oversimplified because young people aren't, aren't taught to question, aren't taught to think critically, and it's, it's really a disservice to all of us, and we need young people to be able to think critically. So I, I absolutely agree with what you said. I think that's, and young people would find that much more interesting and then be able to apply it to their lives today. So thank you. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate your participation. And uh, Mr. Dion. I thank you very much for being here, and I hope that whatever whatever words that may have come out of my mouth and whatever you've seen on the screen, please just go and make an impact upon your life and the lives of others that surround you.